This is an explanation of the meaning of spin angular momentum. Early theories of light and electromagnetism were based on analysis of solid media in Galilean space-time, and scientists wondered if matter could be described in similar terms. Einstein's general theory of relativity ascribed physical properties to empty space. Einstein believed this implied an ether, which would be a substance that carries waves. However, other physicists took the view that since the ether was not explicit in Einstein's theories, it should be discarded. Einstein eventually accepted this attitude. Many scientists even claim that the ether was disproven by ether drift experiments performed by Michelson and Morley. In reality, these experiments only imply that the equations for matter are Lorentz invariant. <clears throat> if matter is described by Lorentz invariant wave equations, then special relativity is simply a consequence of the fact that all measurements are made using these waves. Nonetheless, most physicists still regard the ether as unnecessary because they believe matter can be described without reference to it. This idea can be tested simply by examining the equations for matter. Do they contain terms that correspond to an ether? The answer is yes. The solid ether reveals itself by virtue of its angular momentum, which is called spin. The spin angular momentum density of an elastic solid is indistinguishable from its quantum mechanical counterpart. The fields of the standard model can be interpreted as vibrational modes of an elastic solid. To understand the evidence for an elastic solid ether, it is necessary to understand the classical equation of evolution of spin angular momentum. Fundamentally, motion has two types. Irrotational motion, in which case the curl of the velocity is zero, and incompressible motion, also called rotational motion, in which case the divergence of the velocity is zero. According to the Helmholtz theorem, any momentum density can be described as a gradient plus a curl. For incompressible motion, the gradient term is zero. Spin angular momentum density is the field whose curl is equal to twice the momentum density for incompressible motion. Angular momentum density associated with any momentum density q may be written in either orbital or spin form. The two forms are related by integration by parts. Assuming no contribution from infinity, we can take the integral of the orbital angular momentum and by integration by parts, convert it to an integral for spin angular momentum. These two forms yield the same total angular momentum and kinetic energy, except for boundary terms at infinity. As an example of spin angular momentum, consider a rotating cylinder. It has a parabolic radial distribution of spin density as shown in the equation for S. The equation for the velocity is simply the radius times the angular speed, and the equation for vorticity is simply the angular speed uh, plus a delta function at the edge of the cylinder. Integration yields the usual total angular momentum and kinetic energy. Any angular momentum density may be expressed in orbital or spin form. So why does matter have both types of angular momentum? An elastic solid has two types of momentum momentum of the solid medium, and momentum of the wave. Uh, you can look this up uh, in any textbook on 
elastic wave motion, for example, Morrison-Feschbach. An elastic solid also has two types of angular momentum, spin angular momentum of the solid medium and orbital angular momentum of the wave. Until recently, no one could accurately describe waves in an ideal elastic solid. Analysis was limited to infinitesimal motion because one, it is too difficult to track the motion of a single piece of the solid, and two, analysis of shear strain neglects derivatives of rotations, a problem which is called second gradient elasticity. We can solve these limitations by first of all using total time derivatives to accommodate motion, and secondly, describe incompressible motion in terms of velocity, spin angular momentum, and torque, rather than strain and stress. This allows for arbitrary derivatives of rotation. Angular momentum density evolves due to torque density. And in this equation, the total time derivative includes uh, terms for convection and rotation of the medium. So the definitions we have are spin angular momentum is the total time derivative of a vector potential Q. The momentum density is one half the curl of the spin. The vorticity is one half the curl of the velocity. And the torque is proportional to the Laplacian of the vector potential Q. So this is the equation of evolution of rotational shear waves in an elastic solid. And the definitions of U and W imply nonlinearity uh, in the total time derivative. Now let's analyze the wave equation to see how it relates to the Dirac equation for elementary particles. If we look at the one-dimensional wave, wave equation uh, using a total time derivative, so accounting for possible motion of the medium, uh, we have this equation, uh, which is the ordinary wave equation. And the solution is simply a combination of forward and backward propagating waves. In three dimensions, these independent solutions are 180 degrees apart. Hence, the wave solutions form a spin one-half system, and in three dimensions would require bispinners uh, to represent them. To accommodate rotation in three dimensions, we separate the positive and negative time derivative components, as shown here, where each of these time derivative terms is positive definite. The reason we do this is that the positive axes are right-handed, and the negative axes are left-handed, and therefore they behave differently under rotation. For example, the if you take negative x cross negative y, you do not get negative z. Okay, so we can define the wave function as uh, consisting of these four different components. And when we do that, we get uh, this expression for the z component of spin angular momentum, and this expression for the z derivative of the spin angular momentum. Okay, now that's a one-dimensional uh, wave equation. And we generalize that to three dimensions. We get this equation on the bottom here. So now our spin is defined as one-half psi dagger sigma psi. The divergence of Q is proportional to the uh, gamma 5 matrix. And the double curl of Q is proportional to this expression here, which must have divergence of zero since it's representing a curl. If we compare the Dirac equation for an ideal elastic solid, shown on the top, with the Dirac equation for a free fermion, such as a free electron, which is the equation on the bottom, the only difference is the nonlinear terms inside of the total time derivative. 
And if we expand the total time derivative, um, these nonlinear terms are shown on the bottom here. At least imply the existence of quantized solutions. The elastic solid Lagrangian and Hamiltonian are the real parts of these two expressions. And you can compare that with the Hamiltonian for a free electron, in which case the only difference is that the nonlinear terms are replaced by this uh, gamma zero term, the mass term. We can calculate um, the conjugate momentum and conjugate angular momentum from the Lagrangian. And this is the result here. It's essentially identical to the result from relativistic quantum mechanics. The only difference um, is that here we have the momentum of the wave plus the momentum of the medium. And for angular momentum, we have the moment, angular momentum of the wave, the orbital angular momentum, and the spin angular momentum of the medium. And normally the momentum of the medium is ignored in quantum mechanics, um, but it has been shown that for consistency with general relativity, the energy momentum tensor should be symmetric, and therefore this term must be present. But it's worth noting that it also it has to average to zero um, in order for the solid to remain stationary on average. If we have two wave solutions and try to add them together in the form of superposition, what we find is that these spins would add together, but we also have some interference terms between the two different waves. But if we require that these spins be additive, then the interference terms would have to cancel. And for that to happen, if these are spin eigenfunctions, we would get the uh, Pauli exclusion principle, which uh, says that the two wave functions have to anti-commute. In order to force this anti-commutator to be zero, we can introduce phase shifts into the wave functions, and those phase shifts are the potentials, which describe the forces between the particles. Okay, so in summary, the Dirac equation for fermions is a special case of the general equation of evolution of spin angular momentum in an elastic solid. And historically, Thomas Young explained the polarization of light by analogy with shear waves in a solid. James McCullough first derived the equation of light using an elastic solid model. James Maxwell derived the equations of electromagnetism using a cellular elastic solid model. So one could well ask, is the universe an elastic solid? If it is, then it should have Lorentz covariant standing wave or particle-like solutions. Uh, these solutions would obey the wave uncertainty relations, similar to the Heisenberg uncertainty relations. Measurements would be quantized because matter could only go from one standing wave state to another. Any uh, spin eigenfunction solutions would be fermions. Wave interference would lead to the exclusion principle and also to the interaction potentials. Mirror image solutions would behave like antimatter, and gravity would result from the reduction of wave speed due to slight compression in the vicinity of energy. Okay, so now you understand spin angular momentum.